Okay, hello everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to the first week of new 303, Hypotheses of the Unconscious. As I already introduced, I am uh, Anderson Todd. Mm, you have to give, forgive me, my voice is <clears throat> not quite in its regular ranges today. As I mentioned, I've had some health stuff, and although I am feeling uh, considerably better and very much on the upward swing, um, <clears throat> I'm still uh, just a little bit like maybe I could use a lozenge rather than a coffee, but uh, you know, here we are. So, uh, so I don't want to overload you. This is the first week. There's some readings. You don't need to get too bent out of shape about the readings, but what I want to, I mean, you should start reading them, but you don't have to feel hurried given that I only uploaded the syllabus, you know, today. Um, really what this first week uh, is for lecture wise, and I'm aiming to keep this relatively brief, I, is for me to give you sort of a very brief kind of outline, very brief, of the course, the nature of the course, the course themes, how we're going to approach things, uh, and then to kind of go through in a more detailed sense the syllabus. And that's that's basically what I have uh, in mind for today. And then you can kind of start digging in. Um, I will be offering uh, office hours on uh, Friday uh, by appointment, but don't worry about that too much yet. Again, it's the start of a semester. Things are still very much up in the air. It's a slow start. Don't don't worry about coming too fast off the mark. Um, we will certainly get to things and pick things up um, soon enough. So very briefly, what is this course? So some of you will have done courses with me before, so you will have some inkling uh, of that. Some of you will have read the course description and maybe found that that course description is tantalizing or it touches on some interests. Some of you may have done um, the other courses within the interdisciplinary courses in Jungian theory. So some of you will have done perhaps new 302, uh, which is the full year Jung course. Um, and others of you may just be sort of interest fishing and not really know what this course is about. So the first and I think most um, telling thing about this course, which I've been teaching for a number of years, is uh, that the course uh, has three different names depending on where you look. So depending on where in the system you look, at least the last time I checked, you will sometimes see it listed as hypothesis of the unconscious. You will sometimes see it listed as hypotheses of the unconscious. And you will sometimes just see it listed as the unconscious. Now, that's kind of confusing, frankly, uh, for students and for navigation. But personally, I love it. And that will tell you something very important about this, which is that I think that that particular kind of ambiguity is going to capture, actually, a lot of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with these questions around the unconscious. The unconscious is an ambiguous space where consciousness tends to have precision. The unconscious is a, is a, a more fluid and a more open boundary space, okay? Now, some of you will have some psych background, right? Or you'll have sort of independent reading background. You'll be somewhat familiar with this concept. For others of you, the concept of the unconscious will be a completely new one. Okay, and so I want to delineate right off the bat that when we say the unconscious, what we don't mean is uh, unconsciousness. Okay, so like if somebody uh, hits you in the head with a rock and you black out, you are in a state of unconsciousness, right? We would say unconscious, so they're unconscious, but that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the unconscious in this case. What we're talking about when we're talking about the unconscious is all of those functional components of the mind. <clears throat> and thus within sort of modern, um, you know, uh, uh, naturalist science, right, to the brain to some extent, um, right, but all those components of the mind, which are integral to the functioning of the mind and functional to what makes you you and how you interact with the world, but that are not localized in the conscious sense of self. Okay. So we see these sorts of themes emerge. It's an old idea, okay? It goes back, in fact, thousands of years. You can find it in many different cultures. And one of the things that I will try to illustrate to you as we go through is that, in fact, there are sort of very easy to verify um, experiments that you can sort of run on yourself, right? Which will pretty readily show you that your consciousness is sort of not the only game in town. But we are used to thinking of our consciousness as the sort of sum total of our mind. We identify very closely with our consciousness. And so the unconscious components of our mind, sometimes people will say subconscious components, but the unconscious components of our mind are all of these other um, factors in our mind, right? Uh, sort of forces that impel us in various directions that have an impact on our behavior, on the way that we see things, and that 
Um, you know, with, in terms of modern theory, we first see being really strongly proposed by people like Sigmund Freud, by um, Sigmund Freud's sort of um, inheritors like C.G. Jung, right? I am a neo-Jungian, um, so I have a fairly strong emphasis in depth psychology, but I'm a neo-Jungian, which means that I also have some pretty strong differences. But there is a whole set of sort of late 19th century, early 20th century psychologists and psychotherapists who became very interested in these questions of the unconscious. And if you think about the unconscious, right, if you think about the, you know, if you know almost nothing about Freud, you'll know two things. You'll know lying on the couch and talking about your dreams, right? And you'll, you'll sort of have like a joke image of Freud being like, um, so, some, some, some kind of joke about you wanting to have sex with your mother, right? These are kind of what people know about Freud if they know nothing else. Well, that's a caricature, okay? It's, it's a cartoon of Freud. And Freud, in fact, has some very clever, extremely insightful things to say about the nature of the unconscious. But it, it does, in fact, tag something pretty specific. So if you think, for instance, about Freud's work around dreams, what is a dream? A dream is an experience that you have. Some people will claim that they don't have them. Biology tells us that they likely do, but that they probably don't recall them. But the point is that most of you will have dream or dreams. You might dream frequently, you might dream infrequently, you might dream vividly, you might dream in a, in a very straightforward way. I know somebody who dreams about work almost every single night, um, which seems like a vague Calvinist <clears throat> nightmare to me. Um, you know, to some extent, you will probably have some recollection of your dreams. And the thing about your dreams is they are mental events. They're happening in your mind, right? This is one of the first things we sort of try to impress is that it's in, it's in your head, right? So that you don't have to be afraid of a nightmare when you wake up or what have you. Uh, but you're not doing it, which is to say that it is something that seems to be happening to your awareness, and yet it is within your own mind. That is a good starting point to think about the unconscious. It's part of your mind, but it's not within your awareness. OK, it, if, if there is a sort of a spotlight on the stage, and that's a tricky metaphor, which we'll get into. But if there's the spotlight on the stage that is consciousness, right, the unconscious is everything in the wings of the theater, right? All the people operating the ropes and handling costuming and all this other stuff, all these other functions. And, you know, generally speaking, it is considered, right, both within sort of um, psychodynamic theory, which is where we'll be coming in, but also more modern scientific theory and neuroscience theory that regards this, that the unconscious is actually sort of a much vaster space than the consciousness. Consciousness is powerful and important, but limited. And the unconscious, this much bigger space, is having big impacts on who you are, how you frame the world, how you interact with things, etc. So the unconscious is what we're concerned with, okay? not unconsciousness. Uh, although, as we'll touch on a little later in the course, there are some interesting aspects of unconsciousness, right, being knocked out. Um, for instance, if you look at anesthetic, that can tell you some really interesting things about, about consciousness, but we'll touch on that later. So, okay, so we are concerned with this question of the unconscious. Now, there are sort of three core threads that I hope to take you through. Okay, in this course, you'll see this a little more clearly as we go through the syllabus, but there are three core threads or three things that I want to impress on you. Okay, so the first is <clears throat> just that there is an unconscious. Now, I would tend to say that the evidence for this is quite overwhelming, but there are nevertheless people, there have been people historically and there remain people now who effectively do not believe in the existence of the unconscious. They believe that they have conscious access to the sum total of their mind. I'm going to try to provide evidence to show that that is not the case, right? That, that there is indeed an unconscious, that each of us has an unconscious mind, okay? So the first thing we're gonna to try to establish is that the unconscious mind exists. Uh, and that because it is outside of consciousness, it's quite elusive, right? It's difficult for us to get at. It's necessarily outside of consciousness. So how do we learn about it? How do we infer things about it? That's gonna be a big part of what we're gonna talk about. But first thing, there is an unconscious. I'm gonna to try to establish that. The second thing that I'm gonna to try to establish for you is a hypothesis which emerges, okay, out of the psychodynamic theorists, the early 20th century theorists, Freud, Jung, et cetera, and continues from there with a scientific thread. And that is, we're gonna to try to overturn what I call the unitive bias, okay? We're gonna to try to overturn what I call the unitive bias.
The unit of bias is the bias that we all have, okay, that we are singular unitive beings. We tend to think of ourselves in this way. I am Anderson Todd, and Anderson Todd is me. One name, one person, one body. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that that particular image, one name, one person, one body, is not actually that accurate. That rather, we are a collection of forces, subpersonalities, right, and various interacting dynamics with, I will propose, their own degrees of consciousness. Now, this is something that you can see sort of implicitly right off the bat in the very notion of the unconscious, right? As soon as we say that there is a conscious part of the mind and an unconscious part of the mind, just that one division tells us that the mind has parts, right? And that those parts must interact with each other in some way. If they don't, it's kind of a meaningless division, right? So just in saying there is a conscious mind and an unconscious mind, we are breaking down this idea that it is unitive, that we are just one thing, okay? It's, we have parts. And what I want to further propose is that it's, it's in fact more complicated than that, right? That our consciousness has parts, but that our unconscious also has parts. We are beings of parts. We are more like a community than like, you know, an atom. Well, an atom has parts too. That's a bad analogy. But we're more like a community than we are like sort of a singular individual, okay? In Western culture especially, okay, there has been a very long-standing attachment to the Cartesian idea, I think therefore I am, right? Cogito ergo sum. And although in fact a close reading of Descartes reveals that it's, it's not as singular as all that, people have often come down to this idea, right? It's like one body, one soul, one name, one, 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 right? And what I wanna to try to do is challenge that. I wanna challenge it both from a theoretical perspective by looking at some of the theorists who have proposed um, these sort of psychodynamic accounts, right? So psychodynamic, the idea that we have parts and that there are dynamics between those parts that are relevant to our functioning and our state of being. And I want to look at um, sort of more modern science, uh, empirical investigation that has demonstrated in a variety of ways that we are creatures of parts, okay? So a lot of modern sort of neuroscience and psychology that has looked at the way that our mind functions has gradually revealed this picture that we are beings of parts in cooperation rather than, right, singular unit of beings. That that singularity is something of an illusion that we maintain, right? We're a bunch of people who live at the same address and answer to the same name, but in fact, there are different components. And then I want to lean very heavily on an experiential sense of this, because I think it's the case that most of you will have a kind of intuitive recognition of that, that you will behave differently in different contexts. You will actually feel these differences in your parts, right? So just, you know, off the top, consider these two things. Think about any time that you or somebody that you know has said after doing something, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. What was I thinking, right? Well, to say that indicates that your mind was going in one way and then all of a sudden something else is taking a look and going, what was that about, right? It shows a lack of penetrating insight into your own, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? This is indicative of parts, right? Different parts and substitution between parts that you may not have noticed the change necessarily, right? And you may not be uh, entirely aware of the dynamic, but that nevertheless, there is a dynamic happening. Okay. As another example, think about when you are of two minds about something, you know, a uh, classic version of this is like, you're in a romantic triangle and you're like, oh, well, I really like this person. I really like this person, right? You're pulled in two directions. This is a very difficult, painful state to be in. And it's not just romantic. Okay. Ambivalence can strike us in all kinds of circumstances where we want something, but we also want the opposite right? We feel ourselves pulled in two different directions. And it's extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. It's painful. It's hard to resolve, okay? This kind of ambivalence, this kind of ambiguity in our direction. And what I will propose to you is that a lot of that is a function of parts. It's not that we're one part being pulled in two different directions. It's that the, we have two different parts, each being pulled in a direction, and negotiating between the two of them is causing that kind of sense of, of the distress, right? As though our right and our left hand want to do two completely different things, okay? And the third thing that I will sort of point out around this, right, 
So the first thing was, uh, what was I thinking? And the second thing was, um, you know, oh, I'm of, I'm of two minds, or, you know, like I can't decide, right? These are both sort of arguments for parts. But we're also going to look at, you know, different kinds of states of mind that we get into that are also indicative of this kind of parts. So dream, I already mentioned, that's one that we'll talk about, and we'll talk about it in some detail. But there are a number of other states of mind, states of consciousness, okay, that um, in their own way, demonstrate this um, this sort of parts dynamic nature of our being. Okay. So we're going to do a certain amount of experiential stuff. I'm going to ask you to sort of connect through to your own experience and your own observations. And I will try to make the argument to, to you that we can, A, there is an unconscious, B, the unitive uh, bias is wrong. Okay. And that brings us to our third point. Okay. Because the third thing is going to take up sort of the last half of the course, probably. And that's this that one of the best ways to get a sense of the unconscious, right, in, in some personal sense, to explore the unconscious, to gain knowledge of the unconscious, both scientifically and personally, is altered states of consciousness. Now, what does this mean? Every culture in the world uses altered states of consciousness, okay? Every culture in the world. Every culture has traditions of altered states of consciousness. And one of the things that we will discuss at length is that you know, we have a simplified idea of consciousness. I am conscious or I am unconscious, okay? But that's not a very nuanced view of things. In fact, we go through a variety of states of consciousness in the day, okay? Inflected by emotional concerns, different levels of attention, different levels of construal, right? Our sense of identity fluctuates, et cetera, right? Consciousness itself is fluctuating. However, on top of that, there are these more unusual states. So dream is an altered state, right? Dream is distinctly different from your waking experience, and yet it is an experience that we collectively share. But there are all kinds of these experiences, and many cultures have zoned in on these things as a means, right, of pursuing um, wisdom, right, as a means of pursuing sort of spiritual information or to gain advantage in various ways. So we're going to look at a large number of these altered states, and, and like it's hard for me to sort of encapsulate how, how broad that search can go. Like we're going to be talking about sort of um, religion and religious psychotechnologies, okay, spiritual psychotechnologies. So we're talking there about things like prayer and chant and meditation, um, physical privations, fasting, sleep deprivation, that kind of thing. Um, we'll be talking about things like dance. We'll be talking about things like um, spinning, Okay. And if you think about it, think about kids loving to spin, right? Kids like to spin, make themselves dizzy a lot of the time. Okay. That's a kind of altered state. And it's one that has been used, in fact, in religious settings to specifically induce an altered state. So the, the uh, whirling uh, dervishes of the Sufi mystic tradition in Islam use a kind of continuous spinning and they use it to induce an altered state. And we'll talk a bit about that, what might be going on there. Okay. We're going to talk to some extent about psychedelics. And not just about psychedelics, but about sort of, um, you know, exogenous substance induced altered states generally. Okay. So, um, you know, psychedelics are undergoing quite a renaissance, right? And so look, looking at some of the classical psychedelics, it's easy to see why, right, people are, are excited about this, even if they're quite nervous about it. But we're going to look more broadly because human beings have used over, you know, time and, and space, a huge variety of substances. And humans are not alone in this. Animals do it too, which is one of the things that we will look at, okay? Um, that in fact, animals are widely, are, are uh, have been observed to sort of enter altered states and that there may be specific advantages to that. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground there, okay? From, uh, you know, you name it, like uh, tobacco, amphetamine, cocaine, alcohol, um, LSD, magic mushrooms, DMT, ayahuasca, ketamine, um, salvia, uh, right? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do a bit of a tour through drugs. I don't want you to get the idea that this is just a drugs course <laughs> either, okay? Because those things have a traditional ritual framework often attached to them. And what I'm going to do is try to propose a generalized theory to you about why it is that altered states are um, advantageous, okay, to this question of the connection to and the exploration of unconscious material. We're going to talk about other kinds of techniques for doing unconscious exploration, right? Science is good 
uh, at, a, at a number of things. It's not good at everything, but science is good at a number of things. One of the things that science experimentally has historically been quite good at is getting measurements on things that may otherwise be invisible, right? Gravity is invisible. You can only see gravity by the effects that it has on things. And yet we can make relatively precise measurements of these things. If you think about science as a kind of set of techniques that lets us explore invisible space, right? Explore these forces and factors that are around us that are somewhat invisible. It's not hard by analogy to understand how tools of scientific inquiry might be used to say useful things, right? about the nature of the unconscious, the nature of the unconscious mind. So we're going to describe some of that too. On top of that, so we've already talked about, you know, whatever physical privations, we've talked about sort of religious and spiritual psychotechnologies. We've talked about um, uh, sort of psychedelics, exogenous uh, things. We're also gonna talk about things like art, art, poetry, music, acting. These are all um, sort of techniques right, in a way, psychotechnologies that people have used to get at parts of their mind that they might not otherwise be able to get at. And, you know, the question is both a question of personal exploration, but also a question of, um, you know, sort of the expansion of knowledge, right, learning more about who and what we are as human beings. Okay, so uh, that will eventually connect through into sort of higher states of consciousness. Okay, so we'll be talking about things like insight, things like wisdom, things like mystical experience, right? All of which, um, you know, are widespread. You see them occurring cross-culturally, you see them occur through history, and they're clearly very powerful factors, right, in the human experience and in human transformation. And as I mentioned in my sort of self-introduction, you know, if you were going to bundle everything that I'm interested in into sort of a a pithy set of concerns, my set of concerns revolves around, right, this question of intentional self-transformation. So yes, there's an exploratory aspect to this, but it is also meant to have a certain kind of utility, right? That in learning these things, and this was the goal of some of the original kind of psychodynamic theorists, right? We could engage more effectively, more wisely in a state of intentional self-transformation we can more effectively appropriate our own self-development and become the kinds of beings that we wish to become, right? So um, to that end, you know, when we're talking about mystical experience, we're talking about this sort of thing. We'll also talk about sort of ritual magic. These are, you know, techniques which have been used in many cultures to do this same kind of thing. And, you know, as we'll see, you'll often find that cultures sort of play mix and match with these factors, right? They, it's often a somewhat shotgun approach, right? It's, they don't just do one controlled thing the way that we would in a well-designed scientific experiment, but rather they're using a whole set of things within a cultural framework, including, you know, a bunch of other cultural material and language and training and so on and so forth to try to achieve certain kinds of states of consciousness, but in so doing also gain access to unconscious content. So that is what we're going to be doing in this course. Now, I'll say right off the bat that this course is kind of my baby, which is to say that th this course has been around for a long time. I took a version of it back in the day. But when I took over teaching it a number of years ago, I came in with a very specific view of what I wanted to do. It's been very shaped by my particular interest in things. And this is based in my um, deep belief that um, if I find something interesting, probably other people will also find it interesting. And a big part of my job, frankly, uh, you know, in, in the educational space is less about attempting to convey very specific facts, right? Because scientific facts are flexible, they change over time, right? It's not about nailing down a textbook, but rather it's about nailing down modes of thinking modes of inquiry and about kindling curiosity for people. I take this very seriously. So these are all subjects that I am deeply and passionately interested in, right? I teach this course in no small part because this is what occupies a huge amount of my attention. I think it's really interesting and important. And so one of my goals, right, through the course of this will be to demonstrate to you that, you know, why I think it's so interesting, why I think it's so fascinating, why I think it's so important, right? Now, 
on a quick note in that respect, and then we'll we'll get to the syllabus. You know, I want to point out that there is a level of curiosity that one can have about this stuff. It's neat, okay? Like it's sort of interesting, it's fascinating, it's neat. But I also want to point out that I think it's deeply important. It's deeply important. Why? I often think back to, uh, in this respect, the early 20th century. So in the early 20th century, you know, we had um, World War I. We had a number of scientific advances that kind of destabilized our sense of certainty. Um, so we had, you know, relativity and quantum theory. Uh, in mathematics, we had uh, Gedelian incompleteness, if you're familiar with that. We had these big things that sort of overturned the rationalist assumptions that had dominated uh, the West anyway in the 19th century. And uh, we had what was seemed to be a rational system of control. And then World War I busted out. And all of a sudden, people were being killed by the million upon million upon million in these highly irrational grinding machines of death, right? That introduced a massive shock to cultural consciousness, right? We did not have things under control in the way that we thought we did. Consciousness was not safely in charge of everything. There were unconscious factors at work. In the wake of that, we had uh, a bunch of other things. We had the environmental devastation of the Dust Bowl, okay, specifically in North America. We had the stock market crash of 1929, followed by the Great Depression, right? Economic systems came apart. So environmental systems came apart, economic systems came apart, scientific systems came apart. And then on the heels of all that, we had World War II, which was also exceptionally bad, right? I mean, that's kind of an understatement, right? So we had this series of shocks and World War II culminates with, culminates horribly, with the deployment of the atomic bomb. And if we had the faint inkling in the first world war that we were finally reaching a technological level where it might be possible literally to destroy ourselves, right? then the atomic bomb underlines this in an unmistakable fashion, an unmistakable fashion. You know, the, the horror that emerges from that and the knowledge that we have suddenly reached a place where we are effectively using our caveman brains to deploy forces that could literally eradicate all life on earth was kind of a big deal. It was a psychic shock. Now, if you look at the writers from say, let's call it, 1915 through to 1945, what you get is a lot of apocalyptic thinking. And apocalyptic thinking isn't new, okay? This is something we'll talk about. Apocalyptic thinking is a thread that runs through kind of every culture that has a sense of history, right? If you have a sense of history rather than just cyclical time, then you're gonna have a sense of kind of an end point, right? History as a line, as a linear progression implies um, applies an end time, implies an apocalypse. So people always think the apocalypse is sort of around the corner, imminent. However, um, when you read, you know, writers in this period, um, and there, there are a few we'll kind of look at, you know, there's this real sense that sort of the, the project of civilization is coming apart. Now, people have known for a long time that civilizations do come apart, right? It happens. It, you know, lots of past civilizations have fallen apart, right? Rome is the example that everybody references, but it's not alone, right? Um, so this idea that a civilization can kind of come apart, right, was looming very large in people's minds. And think about it, rational enterprise got overturned, environment seemed to be coming apart, right? Um, it's, it seemed like population was, uh, you know, exceeding our ability to produce food, um, you know, and then we had this massive outburst of irrational violence and then our economic systems came apart. Like this was doomsday level stuff for people. They were very concerned with it. The reason that I bring this up is that's an old idea. Um, it goes, goes back at least as far as the Epic of Gilgamesh, which may be the oldest recorded piece of literature we have in human history, mm. uh, which I'm doing some work around right now. So it's, it's very fresh in my mind, but it's also very much in the zeitgeist now. So, you know, everybody here will, will differ and, um, you know, we're probably not going to spend too much time in sort of open debate about the state of affairs. But what I would propose to you is that as a civilization and as a species, we are in a very tight corner. And most people can kind of sense this in one way or another. People are deeply concerned about the state of the environment, the economy, 
People are concerned, of course, about um, COVID, and it's less about the particularity of the disease, which definitely has a lot of uncertainties, but a lot of it is about COVID slamming in and interrupting people's sense that everything was on a neat track, right? The narrative, you just need to do this and do this and do this, and then if you're good, you get what you want, right? That is the promise that you know civilization makes. Civilization makes us a promise. That's why we behave. That's why we play ball. And that has taken a big blow. You can see the effects of it all over the place, right? So on top of that, we are seeing a modern era where there are numerous additional forces that I am going to propose are impacting very powerfully on our unconscious, right? Uh, social media, foremost among them. So I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking about that. And I'll, I'll preview for you right now. I am not really a social media user. And one of the reasons is that I've had a longstanding opinion um, from back in the day, um, that there is something a bit poisonous about social media. It's not that it's not useful. It's just that the effects that I see in my clients and people that I know and in culture at large are extremely nervous making. So this is something we're going to talk about too, because it is, um, you know, an enormous uncontrolled experiment that we're running planet wide. And what impact is that having on us, right? It's a good question. So we are in many ways at the cusp of what feels like an age of calamity. And, you know, when, when one sort of considers this, I, I think back to a, a somewhat famous quote by um, Owen Barfield. Uh, Owen Barfield was one of the, uh, the Inklings. So this is like uh, the crew of uh, uh, Oxford uh, writers that includes people like uh, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, um, or uh, I'm trying to think uh, who else was in there. Uh, la, 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 la. C.S. Lewis. Um, Owen Barfield was a less sort of celebrated member. He was something of a senior member uh, in that group. And uh, Owen Barfield wrote, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> this is what I get for not queuing my quote in advance. It's terrible. Um, Owen Barfield wrote, and this was in, well, shortly after the detonation of the atomic bomb. He wrote something that I think is very telling from our perspective. Uh, Okay, wait, hold on. I'm just going to pause. Okay, yeah, there you are. I'll excuse my lack of professionalism. Okay, Owen Barfield wrote, quote, the possibility of man's avoiding self-destruction depends on his realizing before it is too late that what he has set loose over Hiroshima after fiddling with its ex exterior for three centuries like a mechanical toy was the forces of his own unconscious mind. Now, you can view that metaphorically if you prefer, but the point to it is this. We are in a pinch. We're at a bit of a crux point. I'm going to make that argument. And in order to pass through this, we are going to have to collectively and individually come to a deeper and wiser sense of understanding about ourselves. A big part of this is that we frankly are individually and collectively deeply out of touch with our unconscious, but we are not uniformly out of touch with our unconscious. And this is a thread that we will go into in more detail as we go, but, and I'll unpack this later, there are lots of forces within society that understand the dynamics, the symbolism and the manipulation of the unconscious perfectly well. So Sigmund Freud's nephew, We'll talk about this, uh, and I highly recommend if you've if you've never seen it, I go recommend you Google a documentary by Adam Curtis called "The Century of the Self." Um, it's a four-part documentary, four hours. But if you watch the first hour, you'll catch a lot of this stuff. Um, I can give you references on that more generally. Um, so, "The Century of the Self." The Century of the Self is the story of Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays. Okay. And when people ask me who I think the most significant, most influential psychodynamic theorist of the 20th century is, I say Edward Bernays. And since I'm a neo-Jungian, they're often surprised by that. i like, who? <laughs> Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He was an American. And when Sigmund Freud was very hard up for money, uh, Edward Bernays sent some money to him. And Sigmund Freud sent back a collection of his books. Edward Bernays worked for the propaganda department in World War I. And when World War I ended, right, 
there was a real problem in the American economy. They were producing too much stuff that they couldn't sell. The reason was that people basically only bought things that they needed for the most part. And so they approached Edward Bernays and said, can you figure out a way to use propaganda in peacetime to compel people to buy more stuff? He's fiddling around with this idea. And when he reads the works of Sigmund Freud, he suddenly sees what he thinks is, is the key. Instead of making a rational appeal to the rational conscious mind, instead he would make an emotional symbolic appeal right, to the unconscious mind. That is what would motivate people. He doesn't want to call it propaganda because that's got a bad name. So he invents a term for it, public relations. And Edward Bernays invents public relations. As we will discuss, right, what he does is he deploys this kind of emotionally laden symbolism directed to the unconscious mind in order to convince people to buy things that they would not otherwise buy. Now, in the modern world, globally speaking, we are in a consumerist capitalist economy, which requires growth. We'll unpack this stuff more later, but the point is it requires growth. The system has to be in a constant state of growth. If people stop buying things, for too long, the whole system gets a heart attack, right? We are sort of tied into the system as consumers. And you can see this, there have been numerous cases where they're like, we need to get economic activity back up. But the whole point is that prior to Edward Bernays, we did not have this broad system of economic manipulation convincing people. And now that is the world we live in. Edward Bernays created out of Freudian theory and the theory of the unconscious, the world we live in. And if that system stops at all, right, the whole economy will fly apart. That's the basic idea. We have to keep buying stuff, including stuff we don't need, right? So this shape of the modern world, if you happen to sort of, you know, pay attention to, to economics and environmentalism, poses some real problems. You cannot have infinite growth within a finite system. Okay, and there are some finer arguments to be made here, and this isn't an economics course. But the point is, we're going to touch on this, because that system, that system of making us want things, making you want things, of learning information about what makes you tick, is what makes the economic system of the world go around. So, in order to get a handle on the world that we find ourselves in, and that may in fact be driving us to destruction, we need individually and collectively to get a deeper sense of who we are, how we work, that we are systems of parts and they come in contact, okay? That's the collective thing. If we are going to sort of pull ourselves back from the brink, this is crucial. It's more important than ever. Now we have better tools than we've ever had. And we'll touch on a lot of the science around this. We have better tools than we've ever had, right? We have better theories than we've ever had. But the point is like the clock is ticking. But also above and beyond that, I wanna point something out, which is that it is always important to me when I teach a course that the courses matter, that they are relevant. I am largely, frankly, uninterested in the idea of the university as an accreditation system that drives people into careers. It's not that I think that that's a bad thing. It's not that I think it's bad to go to university. It's not that I think that it's bad to have a job, although I once upon a time did. And we'll probably talk about that. It's that I don't think that the primary task of the university was or should be, okay, this question of professional accreditation. The point of the university is supposed to be a certain kind of growth and exploration of knowledge. And so it's very important to me that my courses actually connect. I don't want you, I mean, you're gonna walk out of this course probably with some great cocktail party material to the extent that there are cocktail parties now. You're gonna walk out with some great cocktail party material, interesting stories, I hope. Anyway, that is the general feedback that I get. But on top of that, I really hope that what it will do is provoke in you uh, a sense of curiosity about your own mind and the minds around you, right? About what it is that is going on here, what makes us tick, right? Because part of the thing is, if you can't get on top of your own unconscious material, then you are just a victim to it. It pushes you around and you never see why. It's like getting punched in the dark. So this, of course, therapeutically, is a big part of what's going on when you do sort of depth psychological work right, and psychoanalysis and analytical psychology and, right, this kind of thing is that you're doing sort of depth work. You're figuring out these dynamics and forces within yourself, 
how they tie to your childhood, but also how they tie to the present and how they tie to each other and what all these systems of interaction in you are doing and how they respond and so on and so forth. And you do this to get an increased sense of self-knowledge so that you can get an increased degree of freedom over your own self-transformation, but you aren't as prey to these forces that are outside your conscious control. So the reason I wanna point this out, I think it's scientifically extremely important. I think that it's humanistically important that if you wanna understand the nature of human beings, it's important to understand these facts. I think that it's socially massively important and possibly right on a civilization kind of level that we encounter this material. And lastly, that it's, it's personally valuable and it's personally important. Okay, and I have found that in my own life, and I hope to convey some measure of that also to you. Now, the last thing is, because that's all he pretty heavy stuff, it's also fun. Like, it's really fun and interesting. Not always. Sometimes it's stressful, and we'll talk about, <laughs> talk about that. Sometimes you, you, know, you pull on a thread in your own psyche, and what you get surprises you. And I'm going to you know, take big pains here to counsel people to you know, take, take things easy, not push themselves too hard, right? Not overwhelm themselves, et cetera. But at the same time, it's interesting. Learning about yourself and learning about other people is, is interesting and not necessarily in a narcissistic way because it can make you sort of, uh, you know, improve in lots of ways, improve your relationships with people, improve your relationships with yourself, overcome some of the things that are like just punishing you. And right, it's one among many, but it's one of the handles that we can get over our suffering but it's also fun. It's fun. It's interesting. Okay. So it's fun. It's interesting. It's fascinating. It's, it's neat. Um, neat. Sound like such a grandparent. Anyway. Uh, so that is the, the general thrust of the course. Okay. I'm going to expand all that stuff as we go, but that is kind of what we're getting at. Point one, there is an unconscious point two, we are beings of parts. Okay, the unit of bias, we're going to try to push that off to one side. We'll talk about it a little bit, but mostly we're going to look at the evidence that seems to indicate that's not true. And then three, the best way to explore this space, or certainly one of the premier way to explore this space within us, is right altered states, very broadly construed. And we're going to look at a bunch of those and try to come to some kind of unified account of how that stuff is working. And it's gonna take us down some pretty wild and, and sort of woolly paths. So if that sounds interesting to you, then this is the course for you. Like I said, this is my baby. Likewise, my degree, uh, which isn't here, but my degree on the wall someplace says, you know, a cognitive science uh, on it. But properly speaking, if I was 100% honest, my degree should have read probably like uh, magic, that is, in fact, what I basically did my degree in, which is to say that I'm very interested in the application of cognitive science, the application of naturalistic science into understanding this kind of weirdness, this kind of fringe stuff, because there's a difference between, you know, if we're talking about magic, there's a difference between like Harry Potter flying around on a broom and fireballs and the sorts of things that we actually see occurring in cultures. But those things are still often astounding, right, powerful, fascinating right, things that human beings can do and that they have access to. So understanding those unusual aspects of the conscious and the unconscious is a big part of my own project. Um, and um, yeah, and, uh, and I am sort of uh, honored, but also thrilled um, to teach about this stuff and to talk to you guys about this stuff, because lots of you are going to have your own experiences that are going to be fascinating every, every year. It's fascinating. Okay, so enough as an intro. Let's talk about the syllabus. So Oh, I guess I should say one more thing, actually, which is um, <laughs> the term that I generally use, okay, for this like altered states as a way of getting into the unconscious and trying to bring things up is cognitive spelunking, right? Where spelunking is when you like take ropes and pittens and crampons or whatever and descend into a cave. So the idea is cognitive spelunking. So if you're looking at the syllabus and you're like, what the hell, this week was supposed to be on cognitive spelunking. Well, that's what I'm talking about, cognitive spelunking. Lots of this other stuff, the pre-modern views, et cetera. We'll touch on that actually in lecture at greater length next week, but I just wanted to get things lined up. So let's talk about the syllabus proper. So um, as I mentioned, okay, on account of COVID, things are still kind of up in the air. For the first little bit, as I said, uh, I will be posting these lectures online and asynchronous. Um, provided that things proceed according to the university's proposed plan, after that, we will begin meeting in the in the classroom. And that's Wilson Hall, room 524, if I recall correctly. 
So we will begin meeting in the classroom. Um, I will tell you that obviously the um, pandemic so far has been quite unpredictable and often people's desire to you know, push things back into a state of normalcy has not been uh, respected, let's say, by the virus itself. So, you know, based on some of the projections that I've seen scientifically, I think there's a very good possibility that we may be looking at a significant surge in the fall. I'm not forestalling the possibility that that means that we may have to extend our virtual time. Um, that's unfortunate to some extent. Um, I think that there's a real value to classroom culture. Um, but uh, as I've said to a great number of people, like I understand everybody's concerns and I share those concerns, but uh, the virus does not care about those concerns at all. Um, and so safety has to be preeminent. So as it stands, we'll have a, theoretically a few weeks of, um, of uh, online asynchronous. So I post lecture as much as I am doing today. Uh, and then thereafter we'll be meeting in the classroom. If that changes on the ground, it changes on the ground. So we should be receptive to that. And I've kind of prepped in both directions just in case. So, um, however, if indeed we are meeting on the ground and in person, uh, in the classroom, such as it is, masked and appropriately vaccinated and what have you, uh, we'll be meeting on Wednesday mornings. So that'll be from uh, 10 till 1. Um, depending on the day, I may go as long as 1. Some days I will go a little shorter. Um, you know, I, I try not to fill every square inch of the space, but I don't have any problems talking. And frankly, a lot of the time people have questions and we'll go down some side roads and things. So you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, in terms of office hours, I'm handling that stuff virtually for now, okay? If you look on the syllabus, you will see the link to my Zoom, okay? And the office hours, as you will see for this course, are um, Friday from 12.30 to 1.30. If for whatever reason, uh, oh, did I say 12.30 to 1.30? Crap, I messed that up. Oh no, 12.30 to 1.30. I just looking at my calendar wrong. Okay, yeah, 12.30 to 1.30. So, you know, it's an hour on Fridays. I will post up a link on the Quercus so that you can use a, a you can book me uh, so that I don't have people stumbling, um, you know, all, all over uh, each other in terms of this. So we'll have relatively short meetings. If for whatever reason those office hours don't work for you, right, you have a class or something of that kind, that's okay. Just get in touch and we'll try to find a time um, to talk outside of that. Um, Right. Uh, in general, you should reach out to me through Quercus first and email second. So send a message to me through Quercus. It will come to my email. Okay. But um, that's where you probably want to get to first. Uh, if you are asking a question that seems like it is of sort of broad interest to the class, I may ask your permission to post that question along with the answer to the question so that I don't get, you know, whatever, 20 people asking the same question. Okay. So um if you send me a message you need to give me some lead time i get like uh like a, at this point a truly astounding uh, amount of mail i it's it's mind-boggling um so sometimes it takes me time and as i mentioned i'm a pretty busy guy um i do maintain a full private practice in addition to teaching three courses and in addition to research and in addition to other things um and i also try to like have a life and sleep sometimes so um you need to give me some lead time if i don't get back to you within a few hours it's because i'm super busy but i assure you that i i will okay put the course code in your subject line um this is one of the ways that i use to filter things if you don't I may just not see your emails. You need to put the course code in the subject line, okay? Um, obviously that's less important with Quercus, but if you're emailing me. Okay, so as an introduction, if I can read this briefly. This course takes as its starting point selected writings of Freud and Jung on the hypothesis of the unconscious. In particular, C.G. Jung's hypothesis of the collective unconscious. It then engages in a retrospective analysis of contributions to the development of the concept from philosophers, poets, anthropologists, and psychologists, whose work anticipated, directly influenced, or emerged from the theories of Freud and Jung, and their core notion that the psyche and the unconscious are not unitive and singular, but dynamic. Shades of what we were just talking about. From this starting point, the course examines the various ways that the unconscious can be explored and what these various facets, techniques, and altered states offer to construct a more contemporary understanding. Other rele relevant imaginative works and cultural artifacts, such as art, film, cartoons, comics, games, architecture, ritual, tattoo, etc., are also examined and discussed. So as you can see, it's a pretty broad range. Okay, in terms of grade structure, 
So I will give a more extensive breakdown of each of these assignments. I'm just giving an overview now. So I will give a more extensive breakdown of each of these assignments. This is just an overview now, okay? So the first thing that's gonna come up is these short critical responses. How does this work? There are five of them total. They're due on the third week, the fifth week, the seventh week, the ninth week, and the 11th week, okay? So it starts week three, uh, and then it's sort of every two weeks after that. What you need to do is pick one of the readings from, you know, that week or the week before, okay? You, you know, it should be one of the readings from kind of that week or the week before, basically in, in the time since you have written the last one. So your first one, the third one, you might pick a reading from the first three weeks kind of thing. But for the second one, you should pick a reading from, um, you know, the uh, fourth week or the fifth week, okay? Um, so you should be picking different readings as you go. Each one of these is a relatively short critical response. It's only 300 words. However, there is a very specific format for the 300 words, okay? And again, I will unpack this more as we go, but this is an overview. So it's 300 words total, three paragraphs. Each paragraph is 100 words. So you're gonna obviously tell me which paper you have read and which paper you are critically responding to. Your first hundred words is a precy, okay? It's a precy. You are summarizing the reading and giving a synopsis of the points. Why? You're demonstrating to me that you read it and that you understood it. So it's a hundred word precy. A hundred words is not a lot. So you're not gonna be able to mention everything. You're gonna have to be selective. But the point is it's a hundred words for you to be like, yes, I definitely read this paper and I know what it's about, okay? In your own words. The second hundred words, are links connecting it to other course materials or reading or scholarly work. It's about connecting that reading to other things in the course and other people's work. So you might connect it to things that I've mentioned in the lecture. You might connect it to another reading that you've read off the reading list. And I encourage you to read as many as you like. Um, you know, they're, they're interesting and it's a wide variety of, of pieces on purpose, okay? Um, or it might be something, you know, you guys are gonna come from a broad variety of different majors and things. You're gonna have your own areas of expertise. If you connect something to an area, uh, you know, as long as you can clearly explain the connection that you're making, the idea is the second paragraph, the second hundred words is about connecting this reading to other people's material. And then the third hundred words is about your response. That is to say, your own original criticisms, ideas, contributions, insights. This is an opportunity for you to show your own thinking, right? That isn't just a question of like, well, I liked this, right? It's like, okay, but why? What is it that you like if you like it? Or what is it that you take issue with? Or what do you find interesting, all right? This is your opportunity to demonstrate in a hundred words. Now a hundred words and a hundred words and a hundred words, 300 words total is not a lot of space. You're gonna have to be highly selective. So we'll talk about this more as we go, but you're also gonna have to fight perfectionism. Some of you are gonna really chafe against this. Some of you are gonna be like, ah, I don't know how to say everything I wanna say. And the answer is you just, you have to be selective. That's why the constraint is there, okay? Those are worth 5% each, okay? So it's just enough that you kind of can't not do it, um, but not so much that, um, you know, that it should be crippling, okay? So there are five of those. That's the critical responses and you can see what the due dates are. Okay, in week six, you're gonna turn in an extended essay topic proposal. So this is a prelude to your final paper, okay? Your final paper, your big final essay is a, is a great big 3,500 word job, okay? Where you're gonna present an original argument. It's an original research essay where you're giving an original thesis and argument. Again, this is something that I will post more resources on as we go. I recognize that not everybody that's taking the class has like recent experience in essay writing. I am going to try to, for, for some of you, you know, the idea of writing a 3,500 word essay, you're gonna be like, oh man, only 3,500 words. And some of you are gonna be like, oh my God, how am I gonna fill 3,500 words, okay? I assure you that if you are in that latter group, I will try to defang essays unfairly terrorize people. People deal with essays emotionally the way that they deal with like poetry and math. If it's not your thing, it's terrifying and, uh, but it's really not that complicated. It really isn't, 
Okay, and I will demonstrate to some extent. I'll do some additional lecture stuff on this and try to give you some tools to think about it. And I am available as a resource, okay, to discuss ideas. But you're going to be making an original argument, okay, for your final essay. The extended topic proposal, however, which is due in week six, is an opportunity for you to pitch your idea, right? To do some preliminary research, to pitch an idea, and to show me that you are doing that preliminary research, but also that you have some idea of how you're going to approach it. It does not require a thesis. That's very important. You need a topic, like a question, and how you might approach it, but you don't need the answer yet. That often will come about in a later phase, okay? So again, I will unpack all this stuff at greater length, but the point is your topic proposal is due in week six, okay? And that's a, you know, a, a piece that um, is going to have sort of your initial sources, your initial research sources, your topic, what you're interested in, how you intend to approach it, okay? Now, part of the reason for this is I am a procrastinator. Many of you are also, I wager, procrastinators. Procrastinators, sometimes in my experience, need something to give them a bit of a kick in the butt partway through so that they start working on something and don't leave it to the last second. That is a big part of what this is. I want to see that you're on track. And so there's this earlier deadline so that you can make the proposal. And that means that, you know, if you reuse some of the text from your proposal in your essay, I don't care. I don't consider that plagiarism, okay, to be fair. Um, you know, the idea is to get you started, to get you thinking, to get you moving early, but also it's an opportunity for me to give you feedback on those ideas, okay, so that I can say, well, you're going this direction, but maybe that's a bit too loose, like maybe you want to narrow this, or perhaps you want to consider this kind of thing, right, I can give you sort of direct feedback and help you shape things, okay, so that is the uh, essay topic proposal, that's due week six, okay, then the final essay, which is due the second last week, is the essay. Again, we'll talk about this at greater length. We'll talk about what constitutes a challenging thesis. We'll talk about what the standards are for research. There is a lot of flexibility, okay? A lot of flexibility in this essay. As I said, it's an interdisciplinary course. I take interdisciplinary thinking really um, seriously, but also it's deeply, deeply important. And if you get talking to some of the other students in the class who have taken courses with me before, um, I, I hope that they will attest to this. I want people to write things that they're interested in. I don't want you to write a carbon copy cutout paper for me. It does have to meet academic standards, right? There are certain kinds of standards for grades and so on and so forth. That's how this works. That's how university works. But in terms of the topic and the approach, right, as long as we're coming at things within the general rules of the academy, the opportunity to do something that's really interesting and really personal is important to me. Some of you are gonna jump at that. You're gonna have like, oh my God, I know five things I wanna work on. Some of you have too many things and you're gonna have a hard time narrowing. Some of you are gonna be stuck. You either won't have done that kind of work. It'll be unusual to you to sort of do your own. It's like, I have to come up with it instead of, right? Don't worry about that. I can guide you through a little bit. We can sort of play with some ideas around that. But the point is when you're done, this is gonna be a piece of work that's really coming out of you because that will matter to you more in the long run. It's more important. And for those of you that end up going to grad school, it's basically pre-training, right? When you get up to grad school, people stop giving you your topics. And if you become an academic, people really stop giving you your topics, right? If I go into the office, it's not like there's a list sitting around that's like research this, right? It's just, I just have an office space. And then uh, uh, I guess I should think about stuff and research. Like you have to be sort of self-directed. The further on you go in academia, the more self-directed it has to be. And so this is an excellent opportunity in a third year course to kind of connect you through to your own interest, your own curiosity, right? And to be able to connect you through to something that matters to you. And that matters to me, okay? You'll do better work. It'll be easier for you to write you'll be more invested. So we will talk about that more, okay? The last assignment, okay, that's listed here is the reflective journal. So this is something you should basically start now, okay? The reflective journal is um, an opportunity for you to do exploration of your own unconscious. We're gonna talk about lots of different techniques and things, okay? And some of these are gonna really speak to you or you'll be interested in them. Maybe you recently took up a meditation practice. Maybe um, you have become interested in dream work. Maybe you've been doing artistic stuff 
lately. Maybe you have just had a series of insights. Frankly, the pandemic, right, sealed many of us up in a bottle for 18 months. And for the first time for many people, we got a pretty hard look at what was going on inside of us. And frankly, we were surprised. It changed us in some ways, right? People have discovered things about themselves and about other people. So this journal is an opportunity for you to explore your unconscious. Now, again, I'm gonna emphasize this over and over again. I want you to do this in a safe way, but also, okay, this it's, it's not an academic exercise. I'm not looking for you to produce a, a thing that is full of research citations. It is a piece of personal exploration. It's intended to be that, okay? So the main thing that, that you'll be graded on is simply the number of entries and their distribution through the semester. There have to be 20 entries by the time you turn it in, okay? Those entries are predominantly text, but you know, uh, if you occasionally wanna put in a piece of art or something, that's fine. If you wanna do something weirder than that, an interpretive dance, a statue, I need you to run that past me, okay? Um, mostly it should be text, it should be journal entries. There is no especially fixed length. It's not like I expect you to write 150 words per entry each day. Some of you are going to do more than 20 entries, okay? But the point is that there should be at least 20 entries over the course of the semester. You can keep that electronically if you prefer. If you want to keep it handwritten, that's okay too. Then we just have to make arrangements for you to turn in the hard copy, okay? And I want to say there's bound to be personal stuff in there. I recognize that, okay? So, We'll talk about this again more as we go, but if you write something and it's highly personal and after you've written it, you're like, oh God, like I really don't, like this was useful and personal to me, but I really don't want Anderson, like read it. that's fine. You stick a post-it note on it that basically says, skip this. You can't put skip this on all 20 entries. Like I need to be able to determine, but I'm not mostly close reading. This isn't me sneaking in to read your journal. It's me checking to see that you are sort of doing this task of reflecting unconsciously. Now again, some of you are going to have a good handle on this right off the bat. You're going to be like, explore my unconscious, good, check. Okay, good, I'll start right away. Some of you may already be doing it. For others, this is going to be an unusual idea. And so it may take you a little bit of time to kind of get started on it, right? We'll be encountering some of these ideas in class. Think about some of the things that I talked about in lecture today. And that may give you some guidelines, times that you've been of two minds about something or times when you've been like, what was I thinking, right? Reflecting on that a little bit, reflecting about these different parts of your mind and your sense of those parts, reflecting on that stuff is perfectly good journal entry work. If you happen to be in therapy, and I frankly encourage all of my students to get into therapy. I, in fact, encourage everybody to get into therapy. Seeing a therapist, psychotherapist should be like seeing a dentist. Um, I shouldn't say that because some people are afraid of the dentist. It should be like seeing a personal trainer or a doctor. It's the kind of thing where, honestly, it would be a good part of our ongoing health to do so. Um, but that's not how people treat it. They treat it as kind of an emergency situation. So I do make a list of therapeutic resources available to my students, which I'll post up relatively soon. If you've never done therapy before, I highly recommend it. It can be an extremely edifying and useful um, exercise, okay? But yeah, if you're in therapy, you may have, right, insights from therapy. If you're doing meditation, you may have that. There are all sorts of sources for things that are sort of bubbling up out of your unconscious. And this journal, Reflective Journal, is an opportunity for you to explore that stuff and interact it a little bit with the material in the course and see what comes out of that, okay? And then last but not least uh, is participation. There's no attendance grade, okay? There's no attendance grade. There's no mandatory attendance. What I mean by that is, if you are not interested in my lectures, you do not need to attend my lectures to pass this course. You could theoretically pass this course, okay, even do well in this course, simply by doing the readings and doing the assignments. Now, it will be helpful to you probably if you watch the lectures, okay, or if you attend the lectures, um, but it is not strictly speaking mandatory. You will not be tested or there will be no exams based on the things that I say, okay? Now, obviously, if you don't like catch any of that material, it's likely that you may miss some of the kind of thrust of the of the course and that you know might lead you off. But technically speaking, you don't need to. I do not make it a requirement that people, mm, you know, repeat back to me the things that I say. OK, my way of looking at it is this. My lectures ought to be sufficiently interesting and useful that you want to watch them. That's my take. And it's not an entertainment take per se, but it is like interest, curiosity, utility. I want my lectures to be the sort of thing that you frankly enjoy. Seems, seems pretty straightforward to me, okay? And I don't make it 
they are not strictly speaking mandatory. So in terms of, you know, you get behind on them, whatever, you get behind on them. You can't come to class. Hey, sometimes you can't come to class. I used to miss class too. Sometimes I just wanted to sleep in because it was first thing in the morning. I don't recommend you do too much of that, but like we're all human beings here, okay? So, um, so nevertheless, there is something of a participation component, okay? And that can be gotten at in a few ways. Now, there's no attendance grade, but there's a participation grade. If we're in class together, I will have a sense of people who are interacting, people who are talking to me after class, people who are coming to office hours, okay? People who are discussing things on Quirkus, if we get into Quirkus discussions, that stuff will aggregate together to a participation grade because part of what you're doing here is interacting with me, interacting with the community, okay? So theoretically, you could skip every lecture and still do that stuff through various kinds of online means, but I recommend you interact with your peers. It's a much more interesting experience if you do that, and they generally speaking have good things to say. Okay, um, course policies very quickly. So um, I have a relatively strong, compassionate stance on extension, is what I'll say. Okay, I am not the kind of instructor, professor, who is like a total stickler who won't give you an extension. Okay, we're all human beings here, school is not life. Okay, we're all human beings here, things come up. What I do ask is that you approach me in good faith, in honesty. I don't need to know everything about what's going on, okay, but I need to know something. And ideally I need to know it in advance. Now I also understand that there are cases where like, you know, you can be having crushing depression or anxiety and be unable to get out of bed and you missed a deadline and you're terrified because of your previous encounters with school. And so you don't wanna approach me because you're worried that you're gonna be judged and that happens. And so if you get in touch with me, I am likewise compassionate about that. Here are some other things I will advance a compassionate extension response to. Um, I had a horrible breakup. My situation at home sucks. I'm experiencing uh, an, an outburst of symptoms around my mental illness. I have terrible procrastination. I'll give you an extension to that. People are often surprised when I say that, okay? I don't know why. We treat procrastination as though it's in some different moral category, like it's a thing that people choose. People are choosing to watch cat videos on YouTube until three in the morning. It's nonsense. We know the science around this. It's a particular form of anxiety. And I will help you with that. I can't be your therapist, but I can give you some tips and things for trying to break through, trying to break through perfectionism, trying to break through procrastination. But if you're just absolutely stuck, you're like, I'm, I'm grinding metal. Okay, approach me. I, I will have a hard time convincing you of this off the start. And I know this because I've taught long enough to get it. That many of you just won't believe me. You're going to have ingrained beliefs about the way that the school system sort of penalizes things. You're going to feel the need to, to prevaricate and grovel. But I'm telling you now, you don't need to. Talk to your peers. You just approach me. Just approach me. Let me know what's going on and we'll work something out. Okay? There is no, there is no deadline that is worth your well-being. Now that doesn't mean that you can just infinitely kick the can down the road either. And one thing that's extremely important, okay? Not everybody is gonna get an A. Sorry, it's just how the academy functions. I sort of wish that we didn't have to assign grades. That's me, maybe it's kind of hippy dippy, but the point is we do. And not everybody can get them, okay? So the quality of work is gonna matter. And that's not necessarily your own effort matters, but it's also relative to other people's performance and the expectation levels of the grade and so on and so forth. However, you are always better off turning something in than not turning something in. Always, always. Basically, if you turn something in, okay, you're always gonna do better than if you don't. And some people get locked up, they don't turn something in. And so then it's zero, I don't have a lot of choice, okay? And I don't like doing that. So I urge you, turn stuff in, contact me if you need extensions, okay? There is a corollary to all of this, it's very important, which is I maintain a compassionate policy, okay? And, and, I, and I ask like a certain amount of good faith openness. I maintain a good faith openness and I maintain a, a state of charity. And so the reciprocal to that is don't bullshit me, please. Don't bullshit me. Now, I'm gonna point this out real quick. I don't wanna linger on it. it leaves a bad taste in my mouth, but um, don't bullshit me because for a few reasons. One, I'm very good at detecting bullshit. I detect bullshit professionally. That's effectively what I do, right? As an academic, as a therapist, and as a consultant, I have very sharp bullshit detectors. I'm good at detecting bullshit. So if you bullshit me, the likelihood is that I'm gonna know that you're bullshitting me and then you know my charity is likely to erode rather quickly. However, the other thing is, even if you get away with it, that's actually worse for you. 
it's worse for you. Why? Because let's say that you fire a line of bullshit past me, okay, uh, or or any other thing. Let's let's say plagiarism. All of you know what plagiarism is at this point. You right? You try to fire that past. Oh, well, maybe you pull it off. Maybe you're exceptionally good at it, or maybe I'm just having a really off day, or it somehow slips. You're gonna get a good got away with it feeling. Oh, I got away with it. But all that's gonna do is serve to reinforce the behavior. Then you're gonna do it again more. You're gonna do it again more. And at some point down the road, you are going to get caught and it's going to blow up in your face and probably with somebody a lot less charitable than me. So we all know ourselves, humans are very capable of deception. This is something we will talk about, obviously, in, in this question around the unconscious. Don't bullshit me. I, it's, it's just a mark of respect. And I will extend to the utmost my ability to support you as you go forward. Because school ain't easy and life ain't easy. Right? It's just not. And it's a hard year on top of the hard third year. So hard. I understand that people are under stress and I remember what it's like to be a student, okay? So I do have compassion, but I need you to be reasonably straight with me. If you be straight with me, I can help you. Okay, so that's court, course policies. Uh, we kind of touched on this, but uh, academic integrity. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, like don't steal other people's work. Don't plagiarize, you have to have proper citations. I don't, I don't need to unpack all this stuff. You should know the academic code, but frankly, how many people actually read that? The point is, you all know what plagiarism is. So again, if you're like, well, I didn't know I couldn't copy things off Wikipedia directly to my paper, that's bullshit. So don't bullshit me. Okay. Okay. That was the unpleasant part of things. Now, very quickly, because um, I only got a couple minutes. Um, okay. So let's take a look. As you'll see, each week has readings attached to it. I will do a lecture, probably broken into chunks. So I will lecture maybe, you know, initially with these video lectures, I might record an hour and then an hour to make it a little bit more digestible rather than one long chunk. Or in class, we'll do the same kind of thing. We'll take a break halfway through um, where I will talk about some of, some of these subjects. I will not directly mostly be addressing these papers. These papers are for you to read. Okay, and you'll see that's a wide variety of material. I encourage you to read everything that captures your attention. Okay, and frankly, read as much as you can. I mean, these are papers that have been chosen for a reason. If you run this stuff into Google Scholar, you should find it. Some of them, I believe, are also posted up on Quirkus. I don't know if I've been able to get all of them yet, but you should be able to find them, okay? And Google Scholar is your friend. If you've not gotten familiar with Google Scholar, it's an excellent opportunity for you to get familiar with Google Scholar because uh, you're going to need it when it comes around to your research paper. Okay, so very briefly, there are readings for each week, um, which I encourage you to you know, read as many of as you can handle. I am not under the illusion that most students will read most things. It's just, it's just unlikely. Um, but, you know, if you do, I suspect you will get quite a bit out of it, okay, especially relative to lecture and relative to the assignments. Okay, so week one, introduction, pre-modern views, cognitive spelunking. There we are. Uh, week two, icebergs and archetypes. So we're going to talk about Freud, and we're going to talk about Jung. Week three, the games that we play. Um, that's going to be talking a little bit bit about play theory, and we'll talk about developmental psych, we'll talk about Vygotsky. Um, probably I'll also talk a little bit about role-playing games, which is an area for me and something that I think is actually enormously psychologically insightful. So we'll talk about sort of games and game playing. Uh, week four, the multiple self. So we're going to talk about things like um, uh, dissociative identity disorder. We're going to talk about split brains. We're going to talk about um, blind sight. Uh, we're going to talk about various kinds of neurological evidence, but also um, other kinds of evidence for this, like multiplicity within our consciousness. Week five, gates and stairs. So now we're going to start to get into things like um, trance states, hypnosis, which is real. Hypnosis is real. <laughs> and I will show you the science if you're not familiar with it. Hypnosis is real and it's valuable. So we'll get into that kind of thing, right? Some of these early altered states. Week six, saints or wizards, um, is kind of an interesting take on Mm, advanced spiritual practitioners of various kinds. What is a saint? What is a wizard? What do those things mean in cultural context? What's the difference between them? What does any of that have to do with what we're talking about? Week seven, emptiness and plenitude. That's largely kind of a mystical states piece. Okay, we'll be talking about various kinds of mystical states, positive and negative, the dark nights of the soul, but also like the heights of the sublime, positive psychology, etc. Week eight, left hand, right hand, head and heart. We'll be talking about art, We'll be talking about creativity. We talked about visionary experience, left hand and right hand paths, all these different modes that people use to access this wider aspect of their mind in the unconscious. 
Okay, then reading week, don't come to class, don't come to office hours, I won't be there, you shouldn't either. Week nine, sleeping awake. So there what we'll primarily be talking about is we'll be talking about dream, but we'll also be talking a bit about neurophenomenology and, and contemplative experience. Okay. We 10 waking dreams. I try to put as much time as I can in on this, but this is the lucid dream section. And as you will see, lucid dreaming is um, I propose an enormously important mode to understand the conscious, the unconscious, and ourselves, but also it's just fascinatingly weird. And if you can get into the practice, I'll give you some tips on how to do that. Um, I've been lucid dreaming since I was 16 um, and there are ways to learn it. So we will talk about that too. Week 11, insights on the mountain. So this will be talking about insight, higher mystical experience and wisdom. And then week 12, we'll try to sort of wrap things up. We'll consider the idea of the unconscious. We'll consider many of the ideas that, that inform this sort of culturally speaking and we'll try to sort of sum things up. And that's 12 weeks. It's going to blow by real fast. So um, as I said, contact me uh, if you need to talk briefly for office hours this Friday. I will also post uh, additional announcements, so keep your eye on that. I'm hoping this doesn't take too long to process. Um, my internet has been a little slow, unfortunately, so I apologize for that. And I've been a little slow, of course, surgically, so I appreciate your patience. Um, but otherwise, I'm looking forward to this, and I hope you guys are looking forward to it too. So yeah, keep your eye on the announcement boards, and elsewise, um, I will see you similarly through the course of the week, and for uh, another asynchronous online lecture to jump in with uh, icebergs and archetypes next week. Okay, take care.